Hi everyone, this is a continuation of last Thursday's lecture on flow nets so that everyone is ready to hit the ground running on Tuesday with our in-class assignment in which you'll be drawing some of your own flow nets and making calculations on existing flow nets. So we had ended up with this slide at the end of the day on Thursday where um, a flow net under a wall of sheet pile was delineated by first of all noting the boundaries of the problem. Um, so there are impermeable boundaries both in the vicinity of the sheet pile and at the bottom of the aquifer. And we do know that the streamlines have to be parallel to those no flow boundaries. And so um, you could see that sort of parallel streamline developing in the vicinity of the sheet pile. And then we could also just trace out additional flow, um, which is roughly parallel to the bottom boundary at the bottom. Uh, the other boundary that we noted as being important here were two different constant head boundaries, one pertaining to the aquifer surface water interface upstream of the wall of sheet pile, and this other one pertaining to the aquifer surface water in interface downstream of the sheet pile. Um, so this is high, a, a constant area of high hydraulic head, and this is a constant area of low hydraulic head. Um, and the streamlines will connect the, these two in a U-shaped form. Uh, so this is one equipotential line here in green, um, and this is the low equipotential line where the flow ends up. Uh, in order to meet the requirements around these boundaries, the other equipotential lines uh, have to be 90 degrees to the streamline, uh, to, the, to the streamlines that we have throughout the problem. Um, they also have to be perpendicular to the no-flow boundaries, and so the only shape that they could really take are the shape that you see here. Uh, so this is our, our basic flow net under a wall of sheet pile. And what next is I'm going to just go through some rules of how you would draw a flow net. Um, we kind of I kind of guided you through one example, um, but there are a number of discrete rules that you could follow. Many of which we've already talked about informally. So the first rule is to identify the types of boundaries present, whether those are constant head boundaries or no flow boundaries. Uh, and so with no flow boundaries, the rule is that flow is parallel to the boundary, as you can see here. And therefore, the, equi the equipotentials, which have to be perpendicular to the flow, uh, have to be perpendicular to that particular boundary. Okay, the second type of boundary are constant head boundaries. Uh, and one example might be... A the area just underneath a reservoir upstream of a wall of sheet pile or a dam uh, and the area downstream. Uh, another type of constant head boundary might be a river uh, where we know water level in the river that sets what the total head is at the bottom interface of the river and serves as a constant head boundary for the aquifer or at least a specified head boundary. Uh, if we know the level of water in the river we know what the head at that point in the connecting aquifer is. Uh, so with constant head flow boundaries, flow is always perpendicular to the boundary and the equipotentials are parallel to the boundary. And then we have water table boundaries. And really this slide pertains to the portions of the water table that are beneath the surface. Uh, so the Bernoulli equation tells us that anywhere in an aquifer, the total head ends up being equal to the pressure head plus the elevation head. However, at the water table, uh, the, the local pressure is the same as the atmospheric pressure, and so the gauge pressure, and consequently the pressure head, is zero. So therefore, at the water table, the total head is just equal to the elevation of the water table. And this perhaps isn't the best illustration of that phenomenon because it is indeed showing a flat water table. But in many aquifers, the water table ends up being curved. Um, so the Z value varies, and therefore you have different values of total potential uh, all along this particular water table. And so there's no specific rule in terms of drawing components of a flow net that applies to the water table itself. The main rule is that neither flow nor equipotentials are necessarily perpendicular to the boundary. They, they can be, um, and the sh 
sheet pile example that I just showed you is one example of where the flow is perpendicular to th that water table boundary, at least where the water table boundary coincides with the surface water. Um, but that is not a necessity in this particular case. So when you're creating a flow net, there are several rules that you just have to follow. One is that head drops between adjacent equipotential lines must be constant. Um, and this is because the, there's a single value of potential drop that holds across the, flow, the, the whole flow net. Uh, the second rule is that equipotential lines must match known boundary conditions. So if you have a constant head boundary condition, that that constant head region is also its own equipotential line. Uh, another rule is that flow lines can never cross. Uh, you would never have streamlines crossing each other in reality. Uh, flow lines also must intersect equipotential lines at right angles. And then the flow line, the, the polygons that are formed between the flow lines and the equipotentials should approach what's known as curvilinear squares. So what this means is that you should be able to roughly inscribe a circle in them. So th th this is one potential procedure that you could use in actually drawing flow nets. Um, there's no strict right or wrong uh, order to go about drawing flow nets, but this is one that works for a lot of people. Uh, so the first step would be to draw the boundaries of the flow region to scale so that all equipotential lines and all flow lines that are drawn can be terminated on one of those boundaries. And then you would lightly sketch maybe three or four flow lines, also known as streamlines, uh, keeping in mind that there are only a few of the infinite number of curves that are possible. And remember that these streamlines do have to satisfy the boundary conditions and the rule that they have to be parallel to no flow boundary conditions. Uh, and then the next step would be to sketch the equipotential lines, bearing in mind that they must intersect all flow lines, including the boundary streamlines at right angles, and that the enclosed figures must be curvilinear squares. So really, where you might deviate from this prescribed procedure is sometimes, based on your knowledge of boundary conditions, it might make more sense to go ahead and sketch in a few of the equipotential lines and then the streamlines uh, before filling out the whole diagram. Um, but again, this is a procedure that does generally work for a little. So this is just an illustration of what curvilinear squares and flow nets look like. I showed a similar example on the board uh, last Thursday. Um, but if you've drawn your diagram well, you should be able to roughly inscribe a circle, not an oval, um, into the space between the equipotential lines, which here are shown in green, and the flow lines are the streamlines, which here are shown in maroon. So then, in the next step, you might uh, iteratively undergo an adjustment procedure where you're adjusting the locations of the flow lines and the equipotential lines to satisfy the requirements of step three, which included being able to inscribe these circles into the, the um, into the curvilinear squares. This is a bit of a trial and error approach, and the amount of correction is dependent on the position of the initial flow lines that you sketched in. And then finally, um, as a final check on the accuracy of the flow net, and this is probably not something I'm going to require you to do in the exercise on Tuesday, um, but if you are trying to do this really, really well, what you would do is you would draw the diagonals of the squares, and those would also form smooth curves that intersect each other at right angles. And I'll show you an example momentarily. So I'm going to go ahead and draw a flow net for a problem that is actually somewhat similar to the flow under a wall of sheet pile that we just considered, um, but with a slightly different geometry. And let me go ahead and just set up uh, some of the colors I want to use in this analysis. Um, so let's say that we have a, an aquifer that is fairly shallow, um, and I'm just going to go ahead and block out this. This is the aquifer. And then we have a confining layer underneath the aquifer. And I'm just going to shade this to indicate that 
it is a no-flow boundary. And then what we're interested in figuring out is what happens to groundwater in the vicinity of a dam. Oftentimes dams um, don't penetrate fully down into the aquifer um, and might be fairly wedge-shaped like you see here. Ah, my A disappeared. There we go. Okay, so what we want to do now is we want to draw a flow net in this aquifer in the vicinity of the dam. So the steps to embark on are actually kind of similar to the steps that we used in um, trying to evaluate flow under the wall of sheet pile. I'm just going to pick some other colors that we want to use. Um, so first of all, what I want to do is figure out what the no-flow boundaries are. Um, and I'm just going to kind of mark those in black. So the dam itself is a no-flow boundary, and then this interface between the aquifer and the confining layer is another no-flow boundary. So what we know is that in the vicinity of these features, the flow has to be parallel to those particular boundaries. So what you might imagine, and I'm not going to draw these in just yet, are flow lines that kind of come down around the dam and then back up on the other side. And so you can envision that there are going to be these U-shaped flow paths uh, underneath the dam. But the other thing that we need to consider right now um, is that there are also constant head boundaries that we should be aware of. Um, and these constant head boundaries are going to be upstream of the dam. Presumably we have some sort of reservoir here um, where you would have high hydraulic head uh, because you'd be pooling water in that reservoir and then downstream which I'll make this location um, we would have some surface water flow on the other side of the dam uh, but not to the same level as in the reservoir so this is where the flow needs to end up and this is our downstream equipotential boundary so just going with the procedure that was outlined on the previous slides um, I'm going to go ahead and start sketching in some flow lines that start on the upstream constant head boundary, end on the downstream constant head boundary, and follow these U-shaped flow paths uh, around the dam <clears throat> and somewhat parallel to the confining layer. So I'm going to go ahead and just sketch in one of these streamlines over here. Um, I'll sketch in another streamline here, I'm, you'll notice I'm making the streamlines approximately equally spaced. I am drawing this with my finger, and I don't have the ability to enlarge this diagram, so my apologies if it does get a little bit messy. And then here's a third. Okay. So the final step will be to draw the equipotential lines, which should also be about evenly spaced um, with approximately the same scaling or the same spacing as these streamlines. Um, we already have two equipotential lines, both upstream and downstream of the dam. Um, now we have to remember our rules that these equipotential lines have to be 90 degrees to the streamlines and 90 degrees to the no-flow boundary. And so I'm going to go ahead and sketch in one equipotential that satisfies those criteria kind of on this edge of the dam upstream where the dam is coming down into the subsurface and then I'll, I'll do a symmetric one on the other side. Ugh. Actually, I want to undo that because that is not 90 degrees to the streamlines that I drew. So this is the iterative part. You might have to erase every now and then. Uh, let me see if I could do a better job here. Eh, still not 90 degrees, but we'll call it good enough for government work. Um, and then I want to keep trying to draw these 90 degree things without wasting too much time. Um, so they'll be roughly like this, and they should be symmetric because this is a symmetric geometry here. Okay, And they're all terminating about perpendicular um, to this no-flow boundary at the bottom. Okay, so um, just to complete this diagram, I'm going to go ahead and label the green as the equipotentials and the blue as the streamlines. And then just to test this, I'm going to draw a few uh, inscribed circles within these elements. Um, 
just to see if I'm doing a decent job at drawing curvilinear squares. Again, this is hard <laughs> to do with my finger on the iPad. Um, these aren't perfect, but we're going to call them good enough for this particular example. Um, and then the other thing that you could do that was discussed in the previous set of rules is that you could draw the diagonals of these curvilinear squares, and those should trace out relatively smooth lines. Um, and I, this one's a little bit jaggedy, but I think it's just because I'm trying to draw with my finger without really zooming in. But you should see that we did a pretty good job of that if you try that test with this flow net. Okay, a few other points about drawing flow nets. Here you could see maybe a somewhat better representation um, of flow under a dam. Uh, compared to what I just drew by hand. Um, but a few other points. It's not necessary that flow nets have finite boundaries on all sides. Uh, regions that extend to infinity in one or more directions are possible. And so the example that you see here is these um, curvilinear squares at the very edge of the diagram uh, do kind of extend out to infinity, and, and they definitely don't satisfy the requirement of curvilinear squares. Um, but that's okay. And then the other point is that a flow net can have partial stream tubes or squares at the edges or ends of the flow system. Uh, and I think this is pretty consistent with what I just drew. Uh, my bottom streamline was kind of getting squished towards the lower boundary, which is similar to what you're seeing here. So this might be half of a flow element rather than a whole true flow element. And so the way that you would account for that in a prediction of flux through this particular stream tube um, between the bottom boundary and the lower streamline that's being drawn uh, would be to calculate the Darcy flux through that stream tube using the equations we went over before, but then multiply that by one half because it's only half the thickness of a stream tube. So a key point is that it is possible to make many good quantitative predictions from flow nets, um, and this drawing of flow nets was an important advance in hydrology because at one time they were the major tool that was used for solving the groundwater flow equation before personal computing became quite accessible. So I'm going to show you a few other examples of real-world flow nets. Um, this one is an example of a flow net under a naturally occurring topography where you have a curved water table that kind of mirrors the surface topography. Um, and you have these discharge areas. So these discharge areas are actually rivers. Um, these themselves are specified head boundary or, or constant head boundaries. Remember, along the water table, the total head is equal to the elevation. And so total head is highest at these high points in the water table. So water is going to flow from high points in the water table to low points in the water table. And one thing that that sets up is a groundwater divide at the apex of this curve in the water table. Um, so we have streamlines, which are going from just underneath the hilltops to discharging within the stream valleys. Um, and then we have our equipotential lines, uh, which are dashed and 90 degrees to the streamlines. Uh, one of the things that you'll note is that there are these uh, weird, very rectilinear lines that are drawn at the bottom of the figure and then at the high points at the groundwater divides um, and then at the points of discharge, too. And these come from the fact that basically at the bottom of this, there's going to be some confining layer uh, where flow is parallel um, to that no-flow boundary. And so um, these lines are actually required to satisfy the geometry of the subsurface here. One note, these next set of figures are from the textbook chapter, so you could always read more about these flow nets there if anything I've been going over is unclear or a little bit fast. Um, but one other note is that the aspect ratio of the basin, or how deep it is to compared to how wide it is, uh, does have an effect on groundwater flow patterns because um, basically the bottom boundary of, of the basin is a no-flow boundary. And so that bottom boundary and its position determines where the flow has to be parallel um, to the boundary of the region. And so you could develop 
deeper and more U-shaped flow paths in deep basins um, with a small aspect ratio compared to large basins that are wide compared to their vertical dimension, um, or compared to shallow basins that, that are wide compared to the vertical dimension and have a, a large basin aspect ratio. Here's just another comparison showing some more interesting surface topography in basins with a large aspect ratio and basins with a small aspect ratio. And one of the things that you'll notice is that um, when we have this topography, uh, you do develop these U-shaped curves between the high points uh, in the water table and the points of discharge. So the streams, these would be kind of the more concave parts of these profiles. Um, but when you have a small basin aspect ratio, meaning you have really deep basins, um, then you do develop these more regional flow systems uh, where, say, flow goes from the highest point in the water table to one of the lowest points in the water table rather than flowing to a, a local minimum. It flows to the global minimum. And so there's this differentiation between what hydrologists would call a local flow system shown by the L's here, and a regional flow system shown by the R's. And in between that, we have more of an intermediate flow system. And I, I think this graphic does a really good job of illustrating uh, just what those differences are between these different types of flow systems. So here's a few more examples. Here's um, a dam with a somewhat different geometry. Um, and again, the main constraints with this dam are that we need to satisfy, um, we, we basically need to satisfy no flow conditions. Uh, I was trying to get a different color here. Um, yeah, we basically need to satisfy no flow conditions. Wow, I really can't see where I'm drawing. You'll have to imagine <laughs> this. Um, so no flow conditions right underneath the dam, uh, no flow conditions at the base, uh, Gravel is permeable, and so the streamlines uh, end up being um, perpendicular to that permeable layer. This, this would be another constant head boundary further downstream. This is similar to what we developed before, but these streamlines are just not completely symmetric, and they're shifted a little bit further upstream. Um, and then this diagram is showing what the streamlines in the vicinity and, and the equipotential lines in the vicinity of a well look like. I'm not going to go into this uh, in great detail now because on Thursday um, you're going to have a whole class on flow towards wells. So some common errors in drawing these flow nets would include equipotential lines entering or exiting a constant head boundary and you could see a few examples of that um, right over here. Uh, so remember our constant head boundary um, for this particular location would be this whole interface between uh, the surface water and the groundwater. And I'm trying to highlight right here. Um, and you, can't, you cannot have um, equipotential lines entering or exiting that constant head boundary because the constant head boundary is an equipotential line itself. And just as streamlines can't intersect, equipotential lines also can't intersect. Uh, so uh, that's one potential error that a lot of people might make. Um, and another would be disappearing flow lines. Uh, and you could see an example of that. Uh, hold on. You could see an example of that in the lower graph, uh, uh, which is highlighted right here. So you see at this particular point, the streamline kind of disappears into the lower no-flow boundary. Uh, and that's a no-no for several reasons. One, you can't have disappearing flow lines through any sort of boundary. And the second is that <clears throat> streamlines do need to be parallel to no-flow boundaries uh, within a flow net. So these lines that you see here are all problematic. <clears throat> so here is another example, um, pretty similar to one that I showed you earlier. This is just a somewhat more complicated example. Uh, with a dam geometry. This is a dam with a wall of sheet pile right underneath it. Um, so this is a no-flow boundary. The dam itself is a no-flow boundary. Actually, I will go ahead and highlight these no-flow boundaries in black again. Um, so 
oops, sorry about that. It takes me a little bit to select these colors. I was just changing the color of the pointer, not the, the color of the pen. Um, yeah, so just emphasizing what these no-flow boundaries are. I'm just kind of making them a little bit thicker. And then, of course, the bottom here is a no-flow boundary. Uh, so the equipotential lines need to be perpendicular to all of these no-flow boundaries, and the streamlines need to be parallel to those particular no-flow boundaries. Um, and then the other thing that you'll notice is, again, we have constant head boundaries um, upstream of the dam and then downstream of the dam as well. Um, <clears throat> and the streamlines are perpendicular to those constant head boundaries. So you're going to have a chance to uh, draw a flow net for a somewhat different geometry in the in-class example, but I wanted to kind of make this more of a, a reality um, by providing you with a real-world example. So first of all, I want to bring your attention to an article uh, that is linked here, uh, and you could ac actually access that link if you download the PDF for this lecture. Um, but this is an article that just came out in 2019. We're many years out from the Fukushima Daiichi example now, um, or <laughs> disaster now. Um, but the problem of how to clean up radiation in the aftermath of the tsunami uh, still persists. And so, um, one thing that was proposed pretty early on is that, well, first of all, there's all this water. Uh, accumulating within the cooling system of the nuclear power plant, and that water becomes contaminated uh, with nuclear radiation. Um, this whole area has been flooded, and one concern is that groundwater will continue to seep into the plant and add to the amount of water that is already present in the vicinity of, of the cooling system that would then need to be removed and disposed of indefinitely. Um, and so there have been enormous efforts uh, undertaken to try to uh, prevent the f flow of groundwater into this area. Uh, and so one really interesting thing that was proposed pretty early on was to form this gigantic wall of ice uh, around the area um, that is, is trying, uh, around the area where the nuclear reactor is being cooled. Uh, and so this shows a schematic of how the ice wall is being formed. Ice, of course, has a very low hydraulic conductivity. It serves essentially as an aquaclude. Uh, water won't flow through it. And so if you could freeze the soil um, around this whole bounded area, then you could stop the inflow of water and diminish the amount of water that actually needs to be removed from the nuclear power plant and treated elsewhere or contained elsewhere. Um, and so, actually, before I go on, I just wanted to say that, that the article that I linked to is quite interesting. It, um, a reporter is kind of going into the power plant and following the status of the cleanup. And this ice wall was the biggest project of its type ever undertaken. It's tremendously expensive. Um, it seems to be functioning pretty well right now. Um, but one of the things to keep in mind is that unless you build a blockade totally down to the basement layer of an aquifer uh, because of these dynamics that we've been seeing again and again when looking at these flow net examples, you're going to get some groundwater flow underneath um, the walls. I don't think that is the case in Fukushima. I think they're able to freeze all the way down to the confining layer. Um, but it is something that you would have to think about in many other applications where it's not possible to um, to really go down to the confining layer. Oh, one of the things I'm noticing just now is that he, this is where the nuclear reactors are. I was pointing to the wrong area before, um, and the ice wall was designed to block off this particular area. So we're going to make things a little bit more complicated uh, before I release you to um, do this in-class assignment. Um, so right now, we've been dealing with fairly simplistic geometries, fairly simplistic situations where hydro hydraulic conductivity is uniform in the whole area that we're looking at and uniform in all directions. But the reality is that flow nets in real geological settings may be more complicated than what I just now. For example, 
Real aquifers are often anisotropic and heterogeneous. These are two terms that are used quite a lot in, in hydrology, where anisotropic basically means that the property of the subsurface differs depending on which direction that you're talking about. And so in the context of aquifers, an anisotropic aquifer means that the hydraulic conductivity is different in the vertical, horizontal, and or longitudinal directions. And so we might actually have three values of hydraulic conductivity that we need to consider depending on uh, which direction we're doing the flow calculation along. Now one reason for this might be that um, a lot of geologic strata are bedded and the direction parallel to the bedding plane is often the direction with the highest hydraulic con conductivity. Um, you could think of, uh, let me just draw a little picture here. Um, uh, I need to reselect my pen here. Um, so you could think of these layers in geologic strata being kind of laid down parallel. These might be sedimentary layers. Um, but the boundaries between the layers might be boundaries along which flow moves fairly readily. Um, and it might be much more difficult for flow to cross these boundaries vertically. And so this would be a situation in which Kx, or the longitudinal hydraulic conductivity, uh, might end up being considerably greater than Kz, or the vertical hydraulic conductivity. Um, heterogeneous means that there's variability in hydraulic conductivity. Uh, within an area of interest. And so this might um, arise from having different lenses or layers of clay. So these might be clay deposits um, within an otherwise sandy matrix. And the sand, of course, would have much higher hydraulic conductivity than the clay. Um, and so this is just a factor that makes these problems a little bit more complicated. There is a link that I believe you can access from, the, access from the PDF that shows a video of how flow might move around a, in a heterogeneous medium with these clay lenses. Uh, I might be able to show that in class on Tuesday. So here's a real world view of anisotropy. So this is just a somewhat better <laughs> version of the drawing that I just made of the bedded layers. Um, and so the question is, how do we create a flow net for one or more of these conditions. And the first condition that we'll deal with is anisotropy. So let's say that there is anisotropy in the x or the longitudinal direction versus the z or vertical direction. Uh, so the first step would be to kind of rescale the problem. Um, but we're going to rescale it in such a way such that the vertical scale, uh, the new vertical scale, which will be z star, is equal to the same old vertical scale um, that it represents the system in reality. What we're really rescaling is the horizontal scale. So we're saying that our new scale horizontally, so this will, will be an x star essentially, um, is equal to this quantity, the square root of the hydraulic conductivity in the vertical direction divided by the hydraulic conductivity in the horizontal dimension um, times this, uh, this vertical scale. Okay. And then we would redraw the diagram according to the, scale, the scaling above. And then we would um, draw the flow net on the diagram that came out of this third step uh, with flow lines intersecting equipotential lines at right angles and the elements as approximate curvilinear squares. Uh, and so then you would use that flow net to calculate flow um, as you would before, but with a slight correction. So remember, uh, when we're just dealing with an when we're dealing with isotropic systems, uh, the equation that we get for flow um, through a flow net would be equal to um, dar so it would be equal to the hydraulic conductivity, so k times the head drop from one side to another divided by the number of drops. Remember, H over ND itself is the potential drop. And then we multiply that by the number of flow tubes NF. The difference here is that rather than using hydraulic conductivity, we're using the square root of the product of hydraulic conductivity. 
in the vertical and um, horizontal dimensions. And so I'm just going to make these both capital K's again to be consistent with um, the way we've been labeling hydraulic conductivity in the past. Let me go through an example here. Um, so let's say we have an anisotropic soil layer. Uh, this is the soil layer being shown in the tan color. And we have a dam that's drawn in its real world natural scale. Uh, we have a situation where the hydraulic conductivity in the horizontal dimension is four times the hydraulic conductivity in the vertical dimension. So how might we use a flow net approach to calculate flow under the dam? Uh, so I'm going to just basically go through the procedure as outlined on the previous page. So the crux of this is really doing a scale transformation. Um, and the scale transformation will first of all... Oops... I thought I just clicked on the right thing. Um, well, first of all, be to adopt a new vertical scale, but this will just be equal to the old vertical scale. Um, and then the rule is for the horizontal scale, the new horizontal scale, x star. Oops, I don't know how that just happened. Um, so x star, this should be equal to the square root of kz over kx times the vertical scale, okay? And um, in this particular case, we have that uh, kx is four times the vertical hydraulic conductivity. And so our x star ends up becoming kz divided by 4 times kz, and this whole thing is underneath the square root, times the scale, the new scale that we're using for the z. Um, so this ends up just simplifying the two kz's, cross out the square root of 1 fourth is 1 half, so this ends up simplifying to 1 half the vertical scale. So if we do this particular diagram, what this means is that we need to redraw this figure um, with all the features that you see in the figure being half as wide as they are depicted here. Um, so the main effect is going to be not to change the height of the dam, but to change the width of the dam to one half of what's being shown here. So again, here's our original. Uh, and then this would be our scaled geometry. And based on this scaled geometry, we could go ahead and draw in a flow net underneath this, which would look very similar to the flow net underneath the dam that we used before. The only thing that really we would need to change um, is just to use the modified version of Darcy's Law in calculating the total amount of flux through um, this new flow net. So just as a reminder, um, this is equal to the square root of kx times kz times h over nd. Remember, this is our potential drop. Times the number of flow tubes that are in our flow net. Um, and just another way to refer to this would be an effective or an equivalent hydraulic conductivity. We might just call it keq. So that would be equal to the square root of kx times kz. So the final complication or the final complexity that we're going to examine will be flow nets and heterogeneous systems. Uh, we're not going to get as complex as having these clay lenses within a sandy medium. Uh, what we're going to think about are layered systems. Um, and the same rules to uh, apply as in a homogeneous system, but with two exceptions. One is that when you have a layered system, you can only draw curvilinear squares in, in one of the layers. Um, the other layer will not have curvilinear squares. They'll be more like rectangles. Uh, which layer to draw the squares in is your choice. In general, you should choose the thicker, larger layer. And then the second rule is that in the, at the boundaries between layers, the flow lines are refracted. And the physics of this are very similar to that of light passing through different media from air to water as you look at um, a glass of water, for example.
The refraction of the flow passing into a different layer is given by the tangent law. Um, so what this tangent law is, is that, well, first of all, let me establish the, um, the systems, uh, or the system that we're talking about. So uh, number one, layer one here is the top one, layer two is the bottom one. And what this says is that the ratio of hydraulic conductivity in the top layer to the bottom layer um, is equal to the tangent of the angle that the streamlines form with the vertical in the top layer versus the tangent of the angle that the streamlines flow, form with the vertical in the bottom layer. And so we could rearrange this and figure out if we know, oops, we, um, we know what the streamlines are in the top layer and we know what this angle is, we could figure out what that angle should be in the bottom layer um, just by following this equation. So there is one very important rule of thumb here. And that rule of thumb is that for a medium with large contrasts in hydraulic conductivity, um, the high hydraulic conductivity layer will have almost horizontal flow or more horizontal flow in general, whereas the low hydraulic conductivity layers will have almost vertical flow. So in this particular example, the high hydraulic conductivity layer would be layer 2, um, which would have a higher K value than layer 1, where the flow is more at a vertical angle. So I believe this is um, all I wanted to get through. This is all the information that you will need to work through the in-class example, and then I'm, I'm happy to work with groups in class on Tuesday uh, to help you through these problems. Uh, but thank you for watching, and I will see you on Tuesday.